chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I look around the congregation today and I'm blessed. I am just blessed thanking the Lord and the Lord bringing a smile to my heart. Um, you just, uh, just a precious, precious church. I appreciate you. And if you ever, yeah, amen. If you need me any time during the day, please let me know. If you want me to help you visit your family members, all you have to do is call me. Come get me, set up a time. We'll go visit your family members. Sure love my church, and I'm glad that you, I look around. You just keep coming back. Thank God it's the Word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. It's the Word of God. Has to be. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Are you there? All right, the Bible said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Now, we've already been told in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 29, that no man can glory in the presence of God. The Bible said that no flesh should glory in His presence. And that's why if we go back just a little bit, we find out that uh, the Lord chose the weak things to confound the things which are mighty and base things and things that are despised and things which are not. And he says he chose those things to bring about the things that are. And then he says in verse 29 of chapter 1, no flesh should glory in his presence. So no man can glory the presence of God. Abraham was asked, whereof should I glory? But I can't glory save in Christ. I, there's nothing in my flesh I could ever stand before a holy God and glory in. If I'm to glory today, it's because I'm standing up. It's because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything I have, everything we have good. James chapter number 1, the Bible said, comes down from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Thank God He never changes. Every good thing you have comes from God. You ought to be thankful and you ought to glory in Christ. Any spiritual truth that you've received it's because God has revealed it to you. Anything good, if you'll notice in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 2, but God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Back up to verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love Him. A lot of people will read that and stop right there and actually get sermons on some things we haven't seen. But if we'll read the next verse, the Bible said God revealed it to who? To us. Revealed it to us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So any spiritual truth that has been received by us has been revealed by Almighty God. And any so-called new truth you receive is because you've accepted the first truth that God has given you, that He's revealed to you. Jesus made that clear, very, very clear in John chapter number 8, verse number 31. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Didn't say set you free, it said make you free, amen? Make you free, I can be made free by the truth. The end result of the gospel and me believing the gospel is God revealing that truth and I'm made free, I'm made free in Christ. I stand a free man. I stand, of course, uh, saved, holy, justified before a holy God because of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? Now. The Bible said, and, and following, following this continuing my word, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Turn over to John chapter number 8, please, if you will. John chapter number 8. We continue in the word of God. People quit too soon. I've said that many, many times, but people quit too soon. We have people come to the Faith Baptist Church, they hear something, they quit too soon. Might not agree with them. I'm thinking of one, and some people quit and they never go anywhere else. Some people quit and they try to go somewhere else. Some people quit, I was talking to the other day, and they tried to go somewhere else, and the message kept haunting them, so they had to come back. 
Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? So isn't that, that's just great. Now you continue in the Word. You're going to get some truth. And when you know the truth, the truth is going to make you free, is what the Bible says in John chapter number 8, verse number 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If, if, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We stay under the Word, we listen to the Word of God, and all the pieces begin to fit together. We begin to learn these new truths, we accept truths, and as we accept the light that God has given us, and we apply that light that God has given us, God shows you more truth. If you go to verse 36 of this same chapter, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. you made free by the Son. How did I learn of the Son? I got in the Word of God. I came to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school. I began to listen. I began to read the Word of God. I found out who Jesus was, what He had did in my life, and what He had done, of course, on the cross of Calvary was sufficient to take me to heaven. I believe that. Amen. And did you know that I didn't even have to muster up that belief? Here's the beauty of it. I didn't have to even muster it up. The longer I stayed in the Word of God, I believed the Word. God gave me that belief. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For you're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is what? A gift of God. Even the faith that I needed to believe came from the Word of God. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You have something in front of you right now that's priceless. It's the Word of God. Turn over to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Let me just continue this all a little bit. Accepting the first light, the first truth, God gives you more truth. Mark chapter number 11. And it's also recorded in Matthew 21 and Luke chapter 20, but we'll go to Mark chapter number 11 for the lesson. The Bible said in verse number 27, they, they come again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, they're coming to him, the chief priests and scribes, and the elders, and say unto them, unto him, by what authority doest thou these things? Now you know this story, but now if you've been at Faith Baptist Church any length of time, and the Lord, um, they asked the Lord the question, by what authority do, do you do these things? And Jesus um, said, well, if you'll tell me, if you'll answer me a question, I'll tell you by what authority. And then John, the baptism of John, was it of God, was it of heaven? And I give this because it explains in three Gospels how that if they would have accepted a first truth, God would have given them more truth. So they came back to the Lord and said, well, we don't know. He said, if we say that it's of heaven, Jesus is going to look at me and say, why didn't you believe me? And if we say it's of men, then these, this crowd over here believe that John was a prophet and they'll stone us if we say he wasn't from God. So they came back to the Lord and said, we don't know. Then Jesus said there in Mark 11, he said, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. It's not that Christ did not want to tell them. It's because they did not accept the first truth. Did you know the Bible says that God gives light to every man? He gives a measure of faith to every man. John chapter number 1, verse number 9, He's lighted every man that comes into the world. Jesus Christ has given us His Word. He's given us a measure of light. He's given us a measure of faith. Now, my responsibility is to keep declaring that truth so that you would act upon, hopefully and prayerfully, you'll act upon that light that God has given you. And when you act upon that light God has given you, I am, it just blesses my heart, and it'll bless yours even more as God begins to reveal more truth to you. And finally, the whole picture of Calvary comes, uh, comes to fruition. You see that God became a man, went to Calvary, and died for the sins of mankind. And as a result of the gospel and of the result of the work of Christ, I can go to heaven because of Christ. All right, so that's why we need, uh, back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, if you will. Jesus made it clear if we continue in his word, we'll know the truth, and the truth will make us free. That's why we need to be very clear concerning the declaration of the testimony of God. And he gives us that right there in verse number 1. Now, brethren, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Now, when I think about the testimony of God, I've got to get you to hold your place again. We'll keep coming back to 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, but let's go to 1 John chapter 5. Hold your place in 1 Corinthians 2. 
and go to 1 John. Little John, right before Revelation and Jude. Go to Little John, chapter number 5. 1 John, chapter number 5. And look at verse number 9. The Bible said, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is a witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. So here's God's testimony concerning his Son. And that's what the Apostle Paul declared is the testimony of God. Here is God's testimony concerning his Son. In verse number 10, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And then he gives the testimony or the record there in verse 11 that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So here's the record, here's the testimony of God that Paul is talking about concerning His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, His eternal life. That's His name in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 20. God wants you to have eternal life. God wants you to know that you're going to heaven. He's given you the Word of God. He's given you people that love you. He's given you preachers. He's given you teachers. He's given you everything that you would ever need to learn more about Christ. And I pray that you would learn about him and trust him before it's too late. All right, we see Paul, of course, in the declaration of the testimony of God, salvation in Christ. Now, when we begin to read the declaration or the testimony of God concerning his son, we begin to realize that something must be done from him to us if we are to be brought into full fellowship with him. The more I pick up the Word of God, I don't know about you, my dear friend, but as I begin to pick up the Word of God early in my life, the Bible just kept painting a portrait of me as one of a nasty, nasty nature and a bad portrait. It just told me the, uh, of things that I never thought I was. It told me in Romans chapter number 3 that my feet were swift to shed blood. Under my tongue was the poison of asps. It told me, the Bible tells me that I'm a liar. The Bible just, in, in Isaiah chapter 1, the Bible told me that I looked like a putrefying sore that couldn't be mollified with ointment. In Jeremiah, the Bible said, uh, told me that my heart was deceitful and desperately wicked. The Bible told me that I had that anything that I thought must be wrong because there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. After reading all of that, I come to the conclusion there's no hope to get to heaven. There is no hope. Well, if, if I am to go to heaven, something must be done by him on my behalf in order to get me there. Amen. And I began to read the Word of God and found out Jesus is all I need. Jesus is all I need. The Lord Jesus Christ. So we begin to declare the testimony of God. The testimony of God is everything, everything you need is in Christ. I'm going to heaven. You're going to heaven. If you're saved today, you know this. I don't have to tell you. The only reason you're going to heaven is because of Jesus Christ. There's nothing good you could ever do to gain audience with a holy God. Your works are nothing in the world but filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. I don't care what this fellow on TV has been telling you the last four days. The golden rule is not going to get you there. Amen. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that's going to get you to heaven. And if you're depending on anything else, the Lord help you. The Lord help you to open your mind today and just listen. Just listen to what the Bible has to say. All right, so we're going to declare the testimony of God. Then look at verse number 2. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. All right, we should declare the testimony of God. Paul declared the testimony of God. The testimony of God concerning reconciliation, concerning peace, concerning redemption, concerning everything we read in the Word of God concerning the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient to get anyone that will believe him to heaven. All right, now if you'll notice in verse number two, we're saved to keep declaring. Did you know the unsaved we keep seeking? 
If you're unsaved here today and you're not sure you're going to heaven, please, hopefully you've heard enough this morning to know that you ought to seek. People quit too soon. Why in the world do you want to quit? Now I know, and I'm not going to argue with anybody that says salvation is instantaneous because it is. The moment you believe. But to bring you to that point of belief is not instantaneous. We learn truth by truth by truth by truth. And finally it just opens up. And I see it more than I see life. I, by the very, by the very, my very being, my very heart, mind, and emotions, and will, I really believe that Christ is sufficient. And when we rest in that truth, rest in the person of Christ, then you can go to heaven. So we're going to be determined, uh, if you're here unsaved, to keep seeking. If you are saved then uh, we're going to be determined to keep declaring the fundamentals and the rudiments of Christ's salvation. Amen? Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 2, determination. Now, again, the Bible said, not anything save Jesus Christ. Now, did you know that it's not Christianity, but Christ? Christianity is what? It's religion. It's to be Christ-like. Well, everybody ought to be Christ-like. I think you ought to be christ especially if you claim Christ. You ought to be Christ-like. We are to conform to his image. That's, uh, that's the word of God. That's a principle in the Bible. But uh, we're talking about uh, salvation. It's not Christianity, but Christ. It's not a system, but it's the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the golden rule, but it's God's golden grace. Amen. It's God's grace that'll get you to heaven. You know, thousands of things have changed in the world, but not man's moral and spiritual urgency. Therefore, the preaching of Christ crucified cannot grow obsolete. It'll never grow obsolete. Why? Because no mere man can bring in results like the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ can bring. And that's what you'll read in 1 Corinthians. We were kind of going over that last night and men's prayer meeting, if you'll read in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, they had a big argument over who they were trying to uplift. Did you know it's man's nature to always want to uplift man? It, it is. To uplift man, they want, I want somebody that I can lift up here, I can lift up high, and, and because this man is so intelligent, this man is so smart, I think that we can follow him. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. Well, it's just, especially in that culture, with the philosophy going on, it was, always, it was always trying to elevate man. Elevate man. But we should not try to elevate man. We ought to elevate Christ. Because the most intelligent man on the face of this planet cannot bring the end result wrought by the gospel. And what is that? The impartation of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. Amen. No mere man could ever do that. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And the Bible said within that message of the gospel, therein, in that message, is revealed the righteousness of God. Who is the righteousness of God? Jesus Christ. And when that righteousness is imputed to you, then you have eternal life. Men cannot give you that. Not one man on the face of this earth could ever give you that. But the Lord Jesus can. And so we understand the gospel. The gospel is very, very, very important. Again, thousands of things have changed in this world, but not man's moral and spiritual urgency. Therefore, preaching Christ crucified can never, ever, ever, ever grow obsolete. It's a wonderful message. Why? Because preaching Christ crucified talks about redemption. Redemption is by Christ crucified. Whether it be redemption from all iniquity or redemption from the curse of the law or redemption from a vain manner of life, every act and result of redemption is ascribed to the death and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're forgiven because of Christ. I'm looking at the time there. Well, the fact is, just hold your place. Let's go to Ephesians. I'm going to give you some verses. Every act of redemption is ascribed by Christ. Look at Ephesians 1, 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Everyone following along, and we'll take just a little time. 
uh, to go through these verses. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Remember what I said now. Every verse, whether it be redemption from all iniquity, whether it be redemption from the curse of the law or vain manner of life, every act and result of redemption is ascribed to the death and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're forgiven because of Christ. We have redemption through His blood, Ephesians 1, 7. Turn back a couple of pages to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3 and look at verse number 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. He has redeemed us. When did Christ redeem or purchase the world? 2,000 years ago at Calvary. So everything is through the death and the shed blood. Redemption is through the death and the shed blood. Let me read one more to you, and there's plenty I, we could look at, but Revelation chapter number 5 and verse number 9 says this. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations. A redemption by the blood and the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the dignity of Christ's person... The purity of Christ's disposition and the holiness of his life gave value to his death. And by his death, he obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 12 and verse number 15. Did you know as the Old Testament would take the lamb without blemish and put him up and watch him for a certain amount of days, did you know that we got to observe the life of Christ, especially during his public ministry for three and a half years? And did you know that no one could find no blemish, no spot, no sin in the perfect lamb of God? the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, He was worthy to take our sin and die and satisfy the demands of a holy God. All right, now, not only uh, we need to preach Christ crucified, it can never grow obsolete because of redemption, but because of peace of conscience. Peace of conscience comes through Christ crucified. Now, let me, let me dwell on this just for a moment. Peace of conscience comes through Christ crucified. There is no study whatsoever of nature that can bring peace. I don't care how many yoga exercises and meditation experiences you have, you'll never have the peace that Christ can bring. Never. There is, no, listen to this, there is no study of Scripture apart from the cross of Calvary that can relieve the distress of a conscience alive to the heinousness of sin and the imminence of judgment. How do I know that? Well, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 10, if the, only the blood of Christ can, can actually uh, take away that conscience of sin, is what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. Not even, not even the contemplation of Jesus Christ in His spotless example can give any relief. And surely, surely we don't measure up to him. I understand that. But we are more and more conscience stricken till we behold him suffering for our sins. And then we have peace by the blood of his cross. That is when we receive it, we grasp it, and we embrace it as an act already accomplished already accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, isn't that something, though, kind of two groups of people, if we look, and I'm not, this is a whole different sermon, but um, we have two groups of people there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, chapter number 2. We have those that are, that are uh, seeking and looking for salvation, but then we have those that keep sliding the other way. If you will read in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, 
The Bible says for the preaching of the cross in verse number 18 is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolish, made foolish the wisdom of the world? So we, ha we have people thinking by their intellect that they're getting closer and closer when in fact they're sliding further and further. And then we have those preaching the cross that are getting closer and closer to Christ. So basically when I'm looking at two groups of people, we get to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 and it tells us that we ought to declare to both groups, to the whole world, the testimony of God and declare and be determined to keep declaring the fundamentals and the rudiments of Christ's salvation. And sometimes in declaring that truth, you'll have some people in conversation, they'll attempt to go to another subject. You, you, you ever been witnessing to anybody and, and uh, you can be talking to them about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and they want to change the conversation to current events or, or change it to some off-the-wall subject? Well, pray that God would use you and you be determined, just like Paul, you be determined to stay on track, stay on the subject, stay on the message of the Lord Jesus Christ and share Christ with those who need it. Amen? And the whole world, by the way, needs it. And uh, when one understands who Christ is and what the gift of Christ is, and then in that point, when they are actually saved, they can go on to perfection like Hebrews chapter number 6. All right, let me go quickly. I'm, let me go quickly. We've talked about the declaration. We've talked about determination. Now let's look at demonstration in verse number uh, 4. Verse number 4 of 1 Corinthians 2. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. To demonstrate the power of Christ, we first get self out of the way. That's what we need to do. We need to get self out of the way. I've learned that I cannot convince men of Christ. I can't beat them over the head and make them accept Christ. But I can do this. I can declare the Word of God. I can be determined to keep declaring the Word of God. And then look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God giveth the increase. If I really believe what I say I believe, and I really believe what I preach and really believe the Bible, then all my responsibility is, is to make known Christ, and then the Holy Spirit of God has to do the work. And he will bring that soul to that saving knowledge of Christ. I can't make it. I can't give you steps. And I can't lead you in a particular set of words to say and then pronounce you saved. That's not my responsibility. And any man or woman that tries to take the Holy Spirit's job and responsibility is out of place. They're out of place. They have no right. They have no right to play Holy Spirit. But you have every right in proclaiming and declaring and determining. The Word of God. All right, so we simply declare the testimony of Christ, the testimony of God, and the Holy Spirit will do the work. The Bible makes it very, very clear that lost men does not have the capacity to understand spiritual truths. So we give that truth. The Holy Spirit has to reveal it to them. And if you'll notice while we're in 1 Corinthians, look at verse number 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen or ear heard, neither have entered the heart of man. The things which God has prepared for them that love Him, but God's revealed it uh, to us by His Spirit. And then if you'll notice on verse number 14, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Because they are spiritually discerned. Well, a lot of people's had a difficult time with that, because I, before I ever got saved, I, I, I learned some things. I began to memorize some truth and could actually proclaim that truth. But why didn't I come to an understanding myself? That really puzzles me, and I'm going to spend the rest of the time right here. That really puzzles me. If I'm to declare, to determine, and uh, to, to keep preaching the message, and then to discern. If I'm to give the Word of God, if I'm to give the Word of God, determine to give the Word of God, and I really believe that the Holy Spirit has to drive it home to your heart, and I go back to this, then I'm putting myself back where I was. I wanted to be saved, but what I had done is I had put more 
uh, uh, emphasis on what man had said. And because all of these men had said it, then they must be right, and I'm not going to entertain anything that's different. So what I did, according to Matthew 15, is I put man's tradition before the commandments of God. That's what I did. And I was comfortable in that. I was comfortable in that. But I had learned enough to begin to share with people some truths concerning the Word of God. Well, Brother Rowan, you just made a statement that a man spiritually discerned unto the Holy Spirit takes the veil off their eyes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he said he would do that. So, so, so what, what happened right there? Well, if today, hopefully I've preached enough that every last one of you will have no problem at all. There was an illustration given here several years ago, and I think Brother Grady came to Crossville, Tennessee, and he gave this illustration, and it began to open my eyes. There was, and it was simply three circles. Three circles. If you're here visiting, you've never seen it, you really need to pay attention. And, and, and this is circle A that I'm standing. I had no problem, and most people don't. Some do, but most people don't have no problem getting into circle A because we know we're a sinner. Is there anyone here in our congregation today, just to prove a point, is there anyone here in our congregation today that believes they've never sinned? That's what I thought. We've all sinned. Come, show. There's no problem getting us right here. If the preacher preaches we're guilty, we're ugly, we're nasty, we've done things that we shouldn't do, we've sinned against a holy God, we've thought things we shouldn't think, we've acted upon things we shouldn't have acted upon and things like that. Yes, sir, guilty. I'm the first to raise my hand. I'm guilty. But if we're not careful, we get tradition in that says you need to quit doing these awful things. And you need to get on your knees and you need to start naming those sins. And you name those sins and I want you to clean up. So what we do is we get people in church and we start cleaning them up. What, what, what we really do is say, come out of the world of sin and come in the church and start sinning with us. That's what we really do. And we get them all cleaned up and we get them all pretty. And what they do because they don't do the things they used to do. They've cleaned their life up. The preachers helped them clean it up. The Sunday school teachers has helped them. Everybody in church has went and decorated them and got on the right kind of clothes and the right kind of smile, right kind of haircut and everything else. And we get them over here. Hallelujah, we got a church member right now. We're in circle B. We've quit all that stuff. Yeah, I know I was a sinner, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. I've quit all this carousing and nonsense and drinking and carrying on and cursing and I'm a better man. You know what the problem is though with most people? Is they stay right here. And if you stay right here in circle B, you're a good church member. You give your tithes, you pray, you come to Sunday school. You're a good church member. You're a wonderful church member. We're going to make you a deacon because you're so good. We're going to make, and then you get so satisfied in circle B that when somebody entertains the idea that you may be lost, there's no way I can be lost. I'm put, and what we're doing without realizing it is putting the tradition of men over the commandments of God. Because there was, there was a time that you stepped out of circle A into circle B and you didn't know if you'll get honest with me this morning and honest with yourself and a holy God... You, 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 you go back in your mind, what did you really believe when you said you believed when you stepped out of circle A into circle B? Did you really believe that Jesus Christ was God and that He died on Calvary for the sins of the world and there's no way that all of this cleaning up could ever get you to heaven? All of this cleaning up could ever get you to heaven. And so you hear that and then you get mad, you get a little angry, you get wroth and you go out and you try to find somewhere else preaching something else and you will. You'll get it, but when you hear it, something's not sitting right with you, so you have to come back. It's you just have to come back, because you know that you cannot argue with the truth. That was what got me. Uh, I was told to run Brother Grady out of church up there for by a couple of people, and I said, and uh, Charlie, Charlie Rogers up there, he said, uh, well, I'm going to stop him, I'm going to whip him. I said, what are you going to do that for? He said, because of what he's saying. I said, but what he's saying is truth. He just looked, he said, it is. I said, yes, sir, it is. 
He said, well, I just don't like the way he says it. <laughs> I thought, well, that's a good one. I said, well, it don't matter how he says it. What he says is truth, and truth will stand when the world's on fire. Amen. Amen. So I finally realized that from circle A to circle B was man-made. Oh, I'm glad that I don't do what I used to do. But in circle B, I was thinking because what, I, what I'm doing now is not what I used to do and God will accept me. And then I saw the truth of salvation in whom you also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the question came very, very strong to this person right here. What did I really believe when I said I believed? Well, I sure didn't know Jesus was God. I didn't know that until I was 26. I didn't, I didn't know that God was completely satisfied with the work. I didn't know that God did not need me to get me to heaven. I found out He initiated salvation and redemption and reconciliation and made peace before I was ever born. What I had to do is hear it and grasp it. Embrace it. Want it more than life. And finally, 2.30 a.m., one September morning, I got out of religion and stepped into Circle C. Lord God. And got born again. And there's nothing like it. I've never been the same. My wife's never been the same. My family's never been the same. My church has never been the same. Praise Christ. So what are you depending on to get you to heaven? If you're somewhere stuck over here, ah, get out of it. Man alive, get out of jail free card. That's right. Whoo, mercy sakes. All that legalism, all that legalistic do's and don'ts and everything else. Did you know when I finally got born again, God put those laws in my heart and it just comes natural now? Amen. Don't have to, don't have to put a list on my refrigerator anymore. All right. Let's stand to our feet. We'll be. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the goodness of God. Thank you, dear God. We had a man that was determined to declare the Word of God and demonstrated it by his life and his words. I pray that we would be that man or woman, dear God, and keep preaching the gospel that one day, dear Lord, somebody would see the error of their way, Lord, and their thinking and change their mind, which, Lord, that's repentance is what you said, and Repent and believe Christ before it's eternally too late. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.